Now, what's interesting in this kind of fugue is the episode material, the stuff that comes uh, in between statements of the subject. Uh, it's interesting, first of all, uh, as just a psychological need for a buffer zone in between statements. Um, just simply by asking yourself how boring a piece would be if all we kept hearing was a subject all the time. But that putting the right amount of spacing material in between these subjects gives us a chance to sort of hear that subject and, and uh, create a, a structure for the statements of the subjects as the spacing from the episode material uh, provides room in between the statements. And there are two basic uh, pieces of material that Bach is very economical about. I guess one thing I haven't said about this kind of piece is that it, you could do it on finale with a minimum amount of note entry. <laughs> that you can copy and paste your way around an awful lot of it. Uh, of course, once you start saying that, then you start seeing all the wonderful things that Bach did that you'd have to go back and correct, you know, because he never quite does everything the same way. But there is an awful lot of copy and paste kind of thing going on. And I, I don't think that's uh, a cheapness. I think it's, a, it's an awareness of the fact that the, how people listen to music, that um, there's a limit to how much you can absorb, how much you can retain. What makes a piece really memorable is its ability to sort of keep certain ideas alive and allow you to hear something you know, several times so that you have a sense that the composer wasn't just doodling, but actually giving you musical ideas that are important enough to be heard in lots of different ways. And even the buffer material, the episode material, uh, takes on that significance because of Bach's uh, economy in using it uh, in various places, in various ways, in various keys. Um, this first piece of material actually is what we call a codetta because we're still in the middle of the exposition of the fugue. And if you want to be really um, authoritative, you shouldn't talk about episodes until you've finished the exposition. But by all other measures, it's a uh, episode material. And we hear it here, just two voices. It's, it's, it takes the scale part of the counter subject and the, that part of the subject and puts it together in a line that's uh, below the sequence, but an ascending sequence that has, uh, ascending sequence have a lot more tension to them than descending sequences. And we hear that material here, and then it's used over here, but now it's become three voice. Uh, the actual, the, the, it's not just a transposition, your finale, trans your finale uh, cut and paste wouldn't work unless you did some transposition, not only transposing it generally from C minor to G minor, but also transposing uh, the relationship of this line to C minor, to G minor is not the same. Anyway, it's, it's, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the way he did that. But the final result of it is something that has a lot of tangy color to it. It's these false relationships between the bass soprano that created by the way these sequences are working that becomes and then he repeats it so it's more pronounced as it's repeated the thirds are a little feistier than the sixth were It's a great piece of material to be used as a, as a relief from the other subject idea statements. Then we have this uh, tannish kind of material, I guess we'd call it, that is based around the scale that... Uh, with uh, little imitative statements in the soprano and alto above it. Uh, and that's turned upside down. But the, what I want to call your attention to is the final time this comes. Um, and it's uh, just as this purple material, when it came the second time, was amplified both in terms of the voices and in terms of the dissonance and in terms of the length, uh, more statements than we heard the first time around of the sequence. The same kind of extension process goes on here. Now we hear it three times, and the little uh, 
imitative material becomes embellished the third time around. So this, in leading to this dominant pedal, dominant <laughs> moment, which is setting up the final statement of the theme, he's uh, much more uh, florid in his use of this episode material. Um, so that's one thing to look out for. I want to talk about two things at once here and how we experience them. He could have gone directly from here to there. When he gets to this, it makes perfect sense. You can go right away from this G dominant chord into the final statement. Um, any second-rate composer would have done that. What makes Bach such a first-rate composer is that we're not quite ready to hear just charge right ahead into that last statement. So he invents some new material, which is uh, admittedly taken from old material, but has a very fresh kind of sense to it, um, particularly the fact that it starts out with a soprano all by herself. So we get to this moment. <laughs> And uh, if you start searching in that direction, um, you might not become a buck, but you'll become a little more aware of, of how these kind of things work. So, uh, we're ready to go to this beautiful piece. This is a C-sharp major prelude. <laughs> 